you know, my my daughter was asked to write a haiku, and uh, and she wrote, "My father uh, is a sea urchin diver." And she said that didn't sound right, and she changed it to, "My father's life is sea urchins." And so it, strangely enough, it has become my my life that the. I talk about it. I go to conferences. I uh, co-author scientific papers, and, and I and I dive for them uh, uh, as many as over 200 days a, a year. I'm, I'm found out in the kelp beds, and and that's what I uh, hope to be doing uh, until I become an artificial reef out there. My son, who's who's a lot brighter than I am, he says. Pops, you're really good at catching those sea urchins, but you're not much good at selling them. <laughs> you, know, you don't understand the profit motive yet. <laughs> and and uh, Because we have to understand how to make a good living out of this. And, and, and the idea is, is to get as close to the customer as possible, the consumer. We're used to just throwing the sea urchins on the dock and a buyer picks it up and it goes and we get paid for it. Well, I think we have to understand the business of sea urchins a little better. I really enjoyed engineering. I, I thought it was a very challenging job and I enjoyed the stuff, but, but my immediate superiors were always complete assholes. And, and after I was gone for about five or six years, I found out what they had in common, what the problem was with them. It was me. <laughs> and so I started diving and, and I never went back. The freedom of diving just uh, uh, was too much to, to get you to go back and put a suit and tie on sitting in the office. You get up in the morning and uh, you get ready by uh, checking the weather. You may not want to go diving, but on general days, an old fart like me, I'll go out every day because uh, uh, a young guy has good days and bad days. An old guy like me has bad days and average days. So I hope for an average day. So I look at the weather and figure out where I'm gonna work. And so I jump on the boat. I have a deckhand, Kenny, who's been with me since, uh, uh, I call him the young man. Uh, and somebody said, how old is the young man? And I think about it and I say, he's been with me over 30 years. So I said, the young man, I think, is 58 years old. But I still think of him like, like a 23, 24 year old kid because he hasn't changed at all. I take care of all the gear. I run the boat all the time. Uh, you know, I keep record of his time, how long he's been down. And then I have to measure urchins. I measure 30 urchins a day that he keeps record of, you know, so, so he can see their growth. My friend Henry Davis says, uh, to be a good diver, you have to have a high threshold of misery. It, it, it's part of diving. To, you know, on a clammy morning to put on a clammy wetsuit, uh, you can't say you enjoy it. But once you get it on and you jump in the water, all that disappears. You don't just jump in uh, haphazardly and so on. It's not so much looking for the urchins, it's more like cultivating them and harvesting them at the right time. And to do this, uh, uh, we have a, I have an Excel file on the boat and I keep a record of exactly where, where we fished for the last uh, 30 some odd years. And we know how things change. Nowadays, uh, a good day is 300 pounds. 250, 300 pounds. In the old days, you know, before it started getting picked out, they would come in with 2,000, 3,000 pounds, yeah. The sea urchin is a very primitive animal. It has a, it has teeth and spines on the outside. The spines are used to move the, the uh, food around the, the body to the mouth, and they eat the food. The 
Some people see a lot of sharks. Some of my fellow divers, Cliffy and those people, see a lot of sharks all the time. But I was telling my kids that, uh, that, that if you worry about your old man getting killed by a shark, just picture this, that if I get eaten by a shark, 20 years later you're sad or upset. You go down to the bar or anywhere, you say, you know, I'm sad because it reminds me of the day my father got eaten by a shark. And people crowd around and listen and so on. If your father dies of a heart attack, who cares? If your old man dies of a, uh, eaten by a shark, now you got something. Pete Helme is a longtime friend of mine. I've known him for 25 years or something. Uh, we were both diving for sea urchins, so when I met Pete, must have been late 70s or something, he was on a dive boat, I was on a dive boat. Catalina Offshore Products is a company I started in 1977. At the time, I was uh, fishing off Catalina Island, on the backside of Catalina. I was harvesting seaweed and sea urchins back there. If you're not familiar with uh, how uni is created, it starts with the sea urchin. The divers harvest the sea urchins. They do their best to harvest the best quality. They take care of it, keep it out of the sun, keep it out of the wind. We pick it up in our trucks, we keep it in refrigerated trucks bring them to the plant. Early in the morning, the workers come in, they start cracking the sea urchins in half. And the inside, if you crack open the test, inside of it, there's, a, a, there's some chopped up kelp that he's eaten, a, a stomach lining, and the gonads. And what you eat are the gonads. They spoon out the uni, they clean it up, they pull the stomach membranes off, then it goes into a, a bath of ice cold salt water with a very small amount of potassium alum. It's soaked there for about 30 minutes to an hour. It's drained out, and the uni is packed in little wooden trays or plastic trays. It's graded by quality. It's uh, packed in styrofoam boxes, and it's shipped out. Sea urchins have become a big seller. For some reason, they, they used to be very exotic, and you can only see them in sushi bars. When I went to uh, my friend Tony D'Amato at Bocce's. I said, here's how the Japanese crack them open. He said, get away, get away. We, we peel it up like this. He said, we know how to do that. We don't need a Japanese cracker. We started serving search in the last two years. The first three months, my friend Peter Ame was a diver, came to me and says, Tony, would you help us sell market uh, sea urchins? And very good. He goes, well, the reason is we only sell to the sushi place. We want to introduce to more restaurant. And I think I was the first Italian restaurant to serve sea urchin. We serve them live as an appetizer with the bread like caviar. And uh, we serve also with pasta. It's olive oil and garlic and pasta and linguine. And that's a specialty dish, you know, the house specialty. I figured, well, maybe the American are not ready for it yet. But you know what? I was wrong. And I think with the time, uh, more and more, we, we see there's much more, a lot more interest. So people now are just cutting the top off. And you see him walk around on the street with a, a sea urchin with a piece of bread eating right out of the shell. <laughs> We buy urchins from local divers. Here in the markets, I started doing it almost four years ago, and um, it was a chore getting people to eat them. Now we get people coming from everywhere. Like he came in from Dubai because he read on Yelp, so he planned us into his uh, vacation to try it, and he's trying it for the first time right now over there. And today, if I sold, when I started selling them, doing markets all week long, if I sold 30 in a week, that was it. We're, now, just here today, we'll do somewhere around 104 hours. 
That is unreal. There you go. <laughs> I haven't tasted anything like this. I guess if you're a vegetarian, it's like um, biting into a really juicy watermelon. I know it's creamy. It's not real salty. It's very good. It's like a high-end caviar, kind of a nice caviar, not a cheap one. So it's hard to describe the flavor because it's uh, different. Uh, I can't describe it. It's like nothing. It's got the solubility of snot. It's really like a fresh smell off the ocean. It really does not taste like chicken. It's completely different. You know what this tastes like? Sweet and sexy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've gone to the farmer's markets and I've asked them, I said, so where do these come from? And they usually look at me like, I don't know, I guess a farm somewhere. I'm like, no, there's a guy that goes out and risks his life <laughs> every day <laughs> and maintains his boat. And uh, you know, like you say, it has some pretty, pretty interesting stories to tell how that urchin got to that table in the farmer's market. And most people aren't aware that, that they're even diver caught. Well, that's the other thing with sea urchins at this point. It's one of the, I think, the only fishery where we harvest the product, we give it to somebody, and then a week or two later, he decides what he wants to pay us for them. Probably some of the divers will, you know, have to find another fishery or, or get a different job or something because it probably won't sustain their, their income right the way it is right now. We're actually getting paid less money now than I did in 1986. I'm a nonprofit association, but my wife's not going to let me do this for very much longer unless we show a profit. It's a funny. good idea. It's funny that we sit here with these uh, uh, tanks behind us because that was an idea that, that we kind of developed, that the, rather than just selling, selling it to a processor, have them chop it up and tell us what the price is, let's bypass the processor, bypass the middleman, and start selling it to the consumer. It's good for the consumers and it's good for us. It is not to, to displace the, uh, the, the present uh, processor because 90% will still be done that way, but the other 10% is, it has to be done differently. So we started a dockside market uh, in Tuna Harbor. And there are a lot of advantages to, to a dockside market because uh, the way we envision this is first you tell the story of fishing and then you sell the fish. People in a large urban area have no idea where fish come from, how, they, how are they caught, how are they done. And this story has to be told. There's nobody better to tell it than a fisherman. And this, this gets the community into the thing. And we want them coming down to the harbor on a regular basis. Uh, every Saturday we have uh, whatever we have that, that uh, week having that, and having a conversation with the fishing fleet. not young anymore. I think I'm probably one of the youngest guys in this I'm fishery. I'm the youngest. I'm the, really the youngest. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we the whole idea of uh, harvesting for more uh, value t for the product means instead of going out and trying to get a thousand pounds every day as hard as I can, risking getting bent, you know, all this stuff, I could go out and get a hundred pounds and get the same amount of money, which would be better for the resource and it'd be better for me. And, and so, so the idea is, let's figure out if, if there's a will, you know, not, not among one or two, but a larger group to work together to better the things and harvest sustainably. In my mind, there's nothing better sustainable than selling sea urchins for $5 each rather than 50 cents each. Yeah. That to me is a definition of sustainability.
you know, I've been a diver now since 1970, and, and it has given me a good life. And I think my goal now is to make sure that, that the lifestyle exists into the future. In my mind, I, I, see, uh, uh, I see this fishery lasting for a long time, mainly because there's quite a few people that care about it. But I think it's necessary that, that, that we don't say, okay, I'll make my money and I don't care what happens after that. We have to care about the next generation. That, that's, that's <laughs> of course, I, I didn't think about it that much when I was 30 years old. Now that I'm 70, I think about that a lot more. And I also have a lot more respect for older people than I used to have.